Right, a uh, quick biography. Martin was formerly a research associate at Sheffield University. He has lectured at Birkbeck University in London, and he's now an associate lecturer in classics and archaeology at the Open University. He's also research and excavations director for en Enfield Archaeological Society, which has been established for over 50 years, and he's played the lead role in the excavation of the Roman roadside settlement in Enfield, as well as a Tudor royal palace, but that's recent stuff, so we're not fussed about that one. Sorry about it. Can't resist. Okay. Um, tonight, of course, he's going to be talking to us about roads, settlements, and the Cursus Publicus, um, which is, there's very little known about the Cursus Publicus in this uh, country, as I'm sure Martin will explain. But what we do know is fascinating, particularly the settlements that served it. Right. And without further ado, if I can ask you to make a start. Thanks very much. Yes. Uh, so thank you for asking me to speak tonight. Um, I'm going to be talking about some thinking I've been doing about Roman roads, but specifically about what the settlements we find along them might tell us about who used them and how they used them. Um, I should say from the start, my intention isn't to try and prove anything about anything. Rather, I want to raise questions about how we think about the subject of settlements along roads. And these are not necessarily all new questions. Many of them are questions you'll have heard other people raise before. But they're ones I think are worth exploring, especially so that we don't base our thinking on assumptions that don't match real world data. Um, I should say this isn't a terribly easy lecture to put images to, so some of what you'll see you'll be very familiar with and are perhaps a little hackneyed, but um, there are one or two newer ones. Now, I'm not concerned here with who built Roman roads and why. You're probably uh, far more up on that than I am. Um, I mean, the most major, at least, I think we can probably agree, probably the majority began as military constructions for tactical reasons. Uh, they linked forts together, some maybe even marked limits of control zones. Some of those undoubtedly were further improved or at least maintained by civil authorities. I think we can assume that. Um, some roads maybe came back the other ways. Kivitas or even Pegas directed efforts linked to economic factors. I certainly wouldn't rule that out. Conceivably, maybe a few private individuals initiatives. If you've got uh, a significant pottery on your villa estate, you need to market your pottery. Do you perhaps build a road? But as I say, who built roads and why isn't what I'm going to focus on. Obviously, when the road network in any given area came into what we might call its fully developed state, is going to have varied. Many roads, I'm sure you're aware, are not well dated in terms of their initial construction, but clearly in Northern Britain or parts of Wales especially, continuing military presence, changes to army strategy across hundreds of years, some regions will have seen their road networks develop later or over a longer period than others. Again, not really what I'm focused on, but I say that because what I'm interested in is not who used every road by any means. I'm interested in here who used the roads and what for once a region was reasonably pacified and demilitarized. Once it had begun to develop its urban and quasi urban centers. Once trade had settled down into a regular rhythm and once civil administration was established, the region began to look like somewhere that had accepted Roman rule and the Roman style economy.
Now, that probably means I'm not talking about the roads of all of Roman Britain. It certainly doesn't, in fact. Where the military continues to hold sway, urbanism frequently struggled uh, to become established outside, except outside forts and fortresses. Um, the quasi-urban settlement form in much of the north and west, as you'll be aware, is the military vehicle or the Kabe. Um, I've excavated military viki in the Peak District, um, and they are significant settlements, but I think they're quite different settlements to the sorts of ones we find rather further south. Um, so I'm looking at where the military didn't continue to hold sway. I'm looking at who used the roads and what for, particularly in the south and the midlands of England. And I'm thinking about them in and after broadly the Flavian period. So by then, such areas are ostensibly at least at peace. They're in the hands of civil authorities who are following basically Roman government practices. And in fact, I'm specifically concentrating on the road network that fans out from or comes together in Londinium, because that's the area I've looked at the evidence. I don't claim any of my observations drawn from there are transferable to other areas because I haven't looked at the evidence from them. Now, in such an area, though, at, you know, a time in and after the Flavian period, who's using the roads and what are they using them for? Now, that might seem a simple question that we can answer by listing the potential users of roads in such a context. So, Vericundus, the potter, is using them to market his pottery across a smaller or larger region. He's trundling along in a wagon, probably, with large numbers of pots and bowls and flagons to sell, going from settlement to settlement. Or perhaps going from his pottery to shops in settlements. Aulus, the timber merchant, is transporting wood into the growing capital city of Londinium, something we forget far too easily is the sheer amount of wood of different types, be it hardwood, be it coppiced wood, be it just firewood, that something like Londinium would have drawn in. Because of course wood just doesn't survive terribly often archaeologically. We tend to slightly forget about it. The animal bone's still there, but the wood isn't. So he would have probably been driving carts along the road in the London region. Flavia is traveling from her country villa to her townhouse. We probably wouldn't expect there to be great numbers of relatively wealthy people traveling in carriages like the one I'm showing here from Austria, but they surely were part of the traffic along the roads. Caecilius is going to a village to collect taxes on behalf of the town council. And surely in a civil context, roads are used by civilian officials. Cattle and sheep are probably being driven to market along the roads. And of course, even though we're after a time when the area is itself militarized, we should expect occasional or sometimes more than occasional soldiers to be traveling along roads. 
So we can construct a list of potential users of the sorts of roads I'm thinking about. And they may pass along just short stretches of them from settlement to settlement. They might make regular or occasional longer journeys from small settlement to larger town or have reasons to make long distance trips that take them along more than one road through a region into another region. Now, many of the people we're talking about are traveling for economic reasons. A good few are traveling for family reasons. Some are on official business. Some are probably simply itinerant, moving around looking for work. Actually, that's a group I think that are particularly invisible, but we should think about. I excavated quite an interesting site um, on Ermine Street. Uh, a few years ago, just into Hertfordshire, uh, a site where there's no evidence of actual settlement, but there's quite a lot of material culture. And interestingly, it's on a steep slope running down from Ermine Street, or at least we're fairly sure that's the line of Ermine Street. And if that slope had been reasonably well wooded, anyone coming along the road wouldn't have had any idea if someone, say, was camping down slope. But those who are doing the camping down slope would have seen everybody moving along the road. We need to think about itinerant people moving around, perhaps from temporary camp to temporary camp, maybe in a, a circuit on the pattern of a sort of early modern tinker but also probably those with um, slightly more dodgy things that they were up to, who wanted to see what was happening along the road, but didn't want to be seen from the road. They're road users as well. In such an area though, rarely have we got specific evidence of individual travelers or the reasons why they travel. We can show that road networks are used extensively to market goods, for instance. It's fairly obvious to see from the distribution of some pottery in particular, from particular production centers, though we've got to acknowledge that rivers also played a very important role in transporting goods in Britain, and, and that must be the more true, the bulkier the goods that they're transporting. But we couldn't expect to find evidence for an itinerant carpenter, let alone the man going to visit his brother in the next settlement. But we wouldn't seriously doubt, I don't think, that they were amongst the travellers along our roads. But how do we quantify those travellers? And how far did the imperial, and perhaps we're talking here more about the local civic authorities, see roads as for their benefit? How far were the traders, for instance, the main users of the roads? And is it for their benefit that the roads are, for instance, kept repaired? We can't answer the first of these questions very well. Quantifying people traveling along roads is a very difficult thing to do, I think. But with the second question, we may be able to make a little more progress and maybe that'll ultimately help us with the first. So for the Imperial authorities, and they're represented in Britain, perhaps by the provincial governor, the procurator and their staffs. It seems unlikely they had the sort of concept we have today of infrastructure generating economic benefit. Now, tax take was, of course, high up their priority list. And perhaps some of them did recognize better roads, 
meant more goods getting to market quicker and so more profits to tax. But one suspects that this was at best a subsidiary concern once the basic road network was in place, at least for uh, the sort of imperial administration, the procurator and the provincial governor and their staffs. Local civic authorities though, the curias or town councils of the Kivitates, may have been rather more alive to the needs of traders because they might well have been made up of those same merchants or have known many of them. And the civic authorities being responsible for the upkeep of roads in their area, that might well be behind periodic efforts, for instance, to resurface particular stretches of roads. In the same way, facilitating non-business travel for private citizens likely entered the calculation more where someone in authority knew someone personally being inconvenienced by the state of the roads. If Flavia was the sister of a town councillor and the wheel came off her carriage because of a deep pothole, it probably got repaired. However, Basic maintenance of the road surface aside, what potentially tells us about how the imperial authorities saw roads and so how they instructed local civic authorities to regard them is what they established other than the actual road. A major function of roads for the imperial authorities was to enable the functioning of the cursus publicus. Now, the cursus publicus isn't that well known in Britain, it's true. And I rather fear it is too often sort of characterized as a Roman version of the Pony Express. I think too often it's thought of as a system whereby fast riders in relays carried messages at speed throughout the empire changing horses every so often at establishments in the West called Mansiones and Mutationes, which they made the civic authorities maintain every so many miles. I think it's quite easy to fall into this sort of mindset that the Cursus Publicus is a fast dispatch rider service our dispatch rider starting, say, at the provincial governor's palace in Londinium, important communique for the prefect of a legion in his saddlebag, galloping north along Ermine Street, perhaps every 15 miles or something, jumping off his horse at one of these establishments, going down a quick drink, mounting a new horse and galloping on to the next of these establishments until the light went and he stopped for the night at one of the bigger ones, the Mansiones, which were essentially hotels for the use of certified government officials. Well, we don't have great numbers of illustrations of them, but here is one from Rome, which we think probably shows a messenger and indeed other travelers arriving at a Mansio. Uh, that sort of mindset that it was the Roman equivalent of the Pony Express can lead us to thinking that things were all nice and logical and well organized. We can envisage a Mancio at one location, so many miles further on a Mutatio, basically just a horse changing station. The same distance further on another Mancio, then a Mutatio, then a Mancio, and so on and so on along the whole course of the road. The corollary is, the sort of story goes, that where such an establishment is planted and the civic authorities maintain it, there is the need for staff to live nearby. There are opportunities for economic progress to be made, to sell things to official travelers. And automatically a small settlement develops 
which then grows as it provides for not just official, but tra private travellers' needs. It draws in trade from the surrounding countryside. And hey, presto, we've got what we now call a roadside settlement. Now, not in most cases what used to be called, rather unsatisfactorily, a small town, which ended up with a street network, well-built houses, even town walls. No, something village-sized or a little bigger, mostly filled with timber buildings, probably a couple of civil inns, some small-scale industry, maybe a small shrine, but its raison d'etre being its mancio or mutatio, its cursus publicus staging post. <clears throat> well, that seems fine. But before we know it, we end up putting strings of nice evenly spaced dots on maps alongside roads to show where a mancio or a mutatio and a settlement around it was, and then going out to search for the ones there is no evidence for, but we go out and search on the basis there must have been one because it's X miles from the one there is evidence for. That seems to me a bit of a problem for a couple of reasons. One I'll come to in a minute. The other one is this term roadline settlement, which we've adopted. Uh, and it's a better term than some others that have been suggested for the sort of settlement I'm showing. It tends to suggest the settlements there because of the road. And I think that's a danger in our thinking. Now, a settlement that looked identical, but wasn't near a road, wouldn't be called a road line settlement. And we wouldn't be postulating that its genesis was in something that served the road. If a village is going to grow up, where exactly it grows up isn't necessarily determined by just one factor. If a farming settlement grows up, it will tend to grow up in an area where its position is convenient for reaching the fields, for marketing any surplus, things like that. And the road network can act as a magnet so that a settlement that grew up anyway might grow up beside a road, even though the road isn't the primary motivation of the settlement being there. We have to be careful not to put the cart before the horse. By calling something a road line settlement, we are sort of signaling that the settlement's there because of the road, rather than that the settlement would have grown up anyway, but it was just better to grow up beside the road because that gave you a bit of extra income or convenience for marketing your surplus. That's one of my sort of thoughts about that. The other one is, the problem is that if you look round Londinium, these settlements aren't there. Or at least on some roads, too few have been found in the predicted places. And conversely, some roads seem to have too many too close together and too close to Londinium to fit this pattern of sort of fast um, dispatch riders being the primary um, genesis for the settlements growing up. So I don't really think that this sort of nice regular pattern probably ever existed. And what I want to do is to try and think about what the actual pattern on the ground rather than the idea that we have settlements at given distances from each other along a road 
is telling us. Now, a few caveats first. Absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. I'm sure there are new settlements, at least, if not Mancio and Mutatio evidence within them, yet to find along some of the roads radiating from Londinium. Too much ground is covered by urban sprawl and thorough archaeological investigation of development sites, let alone rigorous regional survey, hasn't been going long enough to find everything. Besides, any regular pattern of mansiones and mutationes that did exist will still have been distorted so they could be placed at convenient water sources or near the sources of building material or whatever. And a problem is that the settlements are far easier to find than the mansiones and mutationes that are supposed to be within them. Mutationes, horse changing posts, are going to be pretty much impossible to identify anyway. A mutatio was probably no more than a timber stables. Stables are terribly hard to differentiate from other buildings. And even when they can be isolated, who knows if they were official or private. Mansiones ought to be easier. They're supposedly Romanized. Um, their plan is supposed to have got small, multiple rooms used as bedrooms. They're assumed to be at least partly brick or stone built, likely to have a small baths, uh, likely to have hyper-costed heating and so on. But how far can we, as is too often done, take fines, for instance, of ceramic building materials on their own, in what otherwise looks like a small timber built settlement as evidence for there having been a mansio there. Roman Britain recycled. Roof tiles and hypercost tiles fell off the back of carts. They got scavenged or bought from demolition sites elsewhere and got used for all sorts of things other than roofing and heating well-appointed buildings. Just as examples from settlements along southern Ermine Street, we've got here tile-built kists containing lead Assyria at Enfield. Oh, here at Chesson Park Farm, we've actually got quite substantial industrial structures including a grain drying shed and a rather intriguing long hot air flue with chimneys made of imbrices. These are all built of tile and this isn't even necessarily sort of leftover tile maybe scavenged from a building site. A lot of these are complete tiles. Unfortunately the work that found this is quite old um, and it wasn't done that professionally, so that we don't really know whether the, the tile was likely to have been brand new, but it certainly wasn't all just bits and pieces of broken up tile. You've got large tiles here being used to make pile uh, for a large drying shed. You've got the imprecise being used uh, for a very long subterranean what looks like hot air flu, uh, quite a sophisticated structure actually. Um, and you're looking at a couple of cartloads of tile to build it. So finding mancios is actually quite hard unless you excavate a significant area con uh, containing a decently large one that has got the sort of features that you can point to and go, well, you know, why else is that building in that settlement? And even after those sort of considerations, there just cannot be the regular pattern 
of relatively evenly spaced little roadside settlements that may have had one of these establishments along some of the roads radiating from Londinium. Certainly not enough to envisage our sort of uh, fast uh, express postal service rider uh, sort of driving some comprehensive imperial and local transport policy. And again, the assumption that some of the settlements we do see that we might say, oh, well, that there's a settlement that must have held a mancio or a mutatio and shows us uh, how the cursus publicus was organized. Um, some of them in their genesis aren't that convincing cases for that scenario that you plonk down a mancio and a settlement grows up around it. Old Ford, for instance. Old Ford's about four and a half kilometers from London, Londinium, crossing of the River Lee by the Roman road to Colchester. It's clearly a settlement from at least the Flavian period to the late fourth century. A full extent isn't known, but it seems to have been a sort of linear settlement along the road, occupied both sides of the road, seems to have continued for at least just over a kilometer to the west of the river. There are a few buildings known and some appear to have been of higher status or were Romanized, especially near to the river. And there are some indications of agricultural activity as well. Now, admittedly, there is quite a large and solidly built building near to the river. Uh, and there are some indications that that might perhaps have been a mancio. Um, it did have a hypercast, it did have several rooms. Certainly the excavators suggested it was a mancio. I wouldn't discount that. But we have only got fragments of its plan. We can't be certain. But the outstanding feature of this settlement is the number of burials present. They often come quite close to the road and there are signs amongst them of higher status individuals, stone and lead coffins, even in one case gold jewellery. The evidence is for heavily used, delineated and managed cemeteries running almost up to the road. And I think it surely indicates that the main, especially later Roman role of the site was as a detached necropolis for Londinium. Yeah, as a suggestion, it could also have incorporated a cattle market and perhaps one serving Londinium, wouldn't dismiss that. Uh, suggesting it could be related to providing meat for funerary feasts. Uh, if you've got uh, sort of large cemetery areas, that might well work. A role as a transshipment point for barge traffic on the River Lee has also got to be a quite a possible genesis for it. But a main origin as a cursus publicus staging post isn't sufficiently convincing, at least as yet. Rather, I wouldn't be surprised to find it originated as a shrine or even a habitual point of riverine cremation deposition on the west bank of the Lee, and thence grew as a ritual and a special burial focus for groups from Londinium, who in some way sought to mark themselves out from the wider population. So the suggested Mancio could alternatively have been a number of things from part of a temple complex to an official building supervising significant river transshipment. I'm not rejecting the idea that the cursus publicus required mansiones and mutationes and that that led to the growth of a lot of road line settlements in the London region, even for Old Ford. Um, indeed, I think it probably did. What I'm saying is that we have to analyze the pattern we see and deduce from that what the cursus publicus requirements were, 
not assume its requirements and try to make the evidence fit that assumption. And what led me to think about this was trying to work out why the settlements along Southern Ermine Street are so close together. When I was publishing the excavation I and others have done in the nearest of these to Londinium at Bushill Park in what is now the London Borough of Enfield. So say there was a Mancio at this site at Bushill Park. It's quite possible. We've got a little evidence of a well-appointed building here that may date from early on in the settlement history. Why would it be there, given that it was not quite 10 Roman miles from Londinium, with another settlement at Chestnut Park Farm under six Roman miles further north on Ermine Street, and a third six and a half Roman miles on at Ware, and that itself about six and a half Roman miles south of the small town at Braffing. Even Bushill Park, 9.4 English miles, 15.1 kilometres from the entry to Londinium at Bishopsgate, is a little over three hours away at a moderate walking pace of three miles an hour. That can hardly have been a full day's journey for the average traveller and very far from one for many categories of traveller like our putative Imperial Post Rider. So why was the settlement so close to Londinium? With these settlements so close, to, close together, rather regularly spaced, Southern Ermine Street seems a lot better served compared to many other roads leading Londinium. And its first stop, as we might call Bushill Park, is unusually close to the city. Indeed, if we ignore Old Ford, only one site is that close to Londinium, that's Brentford. Brentford is doubtless sited where it was, 10 miles west of the city, to take advantage of the convergence of river and road routes at that point. The only other, as it were, nearby first stop coming out of Londinium is Welling. Nine and a half miles by road, if you agree with their sort of currently identified courses. They're the only other two even nearly as close first stops coming out of Londinium on any road. The other first stops are significantly further away. You will 14 Roman miles. Sulonasis, it's about 14. Little London is around 15. And if Duroletum, we don't really know where it was, but it's been suggested to be in the Romford area. If so, it's about 13 Roman miles away. Now, is this telling us about the importance of particular roads? Is it telling us that it's a reflection of the importance of Southern Ermine Street and an acknowledgement of the amount and type of traffic it carried. It was the main road north from the seat of provincial administration towards the more militarized areas by Lincoln, ultimately York, thence to the east end of Hadrian's Wall. So at least as far as Braffing, where roads meet or diverge and traffic may have decreased as it took other routes northeast and west or increased as these routes merged to run south, did Ermine Street see more than its fair share of traffic? And more importantly, what sort of traffic? We might cling to our Pony Express idea and say that only certain roads were envisaged as seeing fast rider traffic, perhaps couriers from the continent to the governor in Londinium and from him to the military in the north. But how often did the emperor write urgently to the governor of Britannia and vice versa? Pliny was governor of Bithynia. 
he was constantly writing to Trajan, but he almost never actually wrote about anything that we called very urgent. Rather, what I'd like to suggest is that we too easily forget that the Cursus Publicus was not just a postal system. It was that, but it was also a system that allowed official travellers to stay at hotels or change mounts, whatever speed they were travelling at and on whatever business. That is the Pony Express rider and the officer travelling to a new posting in the north sedately, slowly, in his own carriage, and the temporarily seconded centurion returning to his unit at a gentle canter, and the procurator's freedman with his staff and a military escort travelling at walking pace from settlement to settlement to check the tax receipts or even collect taxes in kind and the officer commanding a slow moving convoy of bullock carts of supplies for the northern forts. And the Classis Britannica officer going quickly to London to give the governor intelligence reports about piracy in the channel. All of these would use particularly the roads we see the decent sequences of stopping places along, roads just such as Southern Ermine Street. And this sort of official traffic often needed not the rapid mount changing facilities our fast postal system required, but safe parking and often changes of draft animals. Indeed, the other road to or from Londinium that looks to have had a particularly frequent road line settlement uh, crop and has a close first stop to the city is Watling Street. Now here the evidence of dense villa settlement in areas such as the Cray Valley and of course the status of one of the settlements on the road, Canterbury, Civitas Capital, has got to be considered. But what did Watling Street lead to? It led to some of the most important cross-channel ports, Rikba, Dover, Limpney. If Cursus Publicus provision for both rapidly moving travellers and slower moving travellers, including perhaps supply convoys, was part of the functions of settlements like Welling, Crayford, Dartford, Springhead, Rochester and Ospring, might that explain their number and even something of the focus on temples seen in some of them? where the perils of travel might be diminished by propitiations. How far indeed was Londinium a destination? And how far another, if major, stopping point on journeys that were a lot more about people and goods getting between the Channel ports and the rest of Britain, including the militarised north, via Watling Street and then Ermine Street? There's a tendency to see Londinium uh, as in a different category to other urbanised settlements in Roman Britain. But should we? Are we projecting modern London back onto Roman Londinium? Londinium is the biggest nodal point in the road network. But frankly, how much has that got to do with the point that to get anywhere further north from the most obvious channel crossings, one has to get across the Thames somewhere. As transport was as much a matter of river boats as road vehicles, of course you crossed where both could come together most easily, which happened to be at what we today call the City of London. And once one has a crossing, it's easier to run all routes through it. It almost comes to have a gravitational attraction for transport links. Actually, it still does try to travel to many places in the southeast from other places in the southeast or even further afield by train, you'll find you have to go via London, even though you have no wish or reason to visit the city itself. So was Londinium so important that we can assume that it being a major road hub means that everyone wanted to go there? 
Maybe we should be following the money to answer that. For the imperial authorities, after the conquest and then the difficult years of the Boudican Rebellion, their money was overwhelmingly spent in northern Britain and to a degree Wales. Their big ticket item was the army. And whatever the single fairly small fort at Cripplegate implies, the army in Londinium cannot have amounted to much more than a small bodyguard for the provincial governor and some officers it seconded from the legions as administrators. Imperial money might have flowed through Londinium, but the word is through. It came out the other side and went north and to a degree west to pay the troops, buy their supplies, provide their horses, even pay off their enemies in the later centuries. Even whilst this idea of journeys of people and goods between the channel ports and the rest of Britain beyond Londinium might not have brought especially large numbers of travellers to settlements like Bushill Park, perhaps many of them would have been slaves and muleteers with little to spend to make the settlements large or prosperous, it may have been thought to require closely spaced and perhaps substantial mutationes at which to see to the needs of animals. That might be at the end of or even during a day's travel. Now, whether all would have uh, been a mancio may have depended on how many more senior officers or administrators accompanied something like a convoy, because it would have been the officers, surely, who were entitled to use the mancios. But presumably, as well as something like supply convoys, there were a steady stream of officially sanctioned, probably mainly army officers and administrators, who would have been traveling faster than something like a supply convoy, but still not at breakneck speed, and been traveling between the capital or ports and the army bases of the north. We must not necessarily focus only on travelers coming from Londinium. Others will have been traveling to Londinium from a variety of places, or as I say, just via Londinium to new postings or the ports, and will have only joined Ermine Street at Brapping or further north. Their requirements will have been dominated by where they'd begun their journey, how fast they were traveling, what sort of transport they were using. We cannot be sure that all the road line settlements, for instance, on Ermine Street, held mansiones or mutationes. Equally, on a particularly heavily traveled route, one entitled traveller might need official facilities at Chesson Park Farm, which he reached mid-afternoon, while another could reach Bush Hill Park by the same time, but neither could hope to arrive at Londinium before night. One, one suspects that some planned establishment may even have rapidly ceased to be used, while others could have been established later or upgraded at what turned out to be better intervals for the reality of this wide variety of journeys, probably particularly those made by more senior officials. In fact, we probably need to suspect that where at least exactly Cursus Publicus establishments were cited would be determined by the administrative elite personally more than on the basis of some grand plan. And convenience for that elite might not only have comprised where they wanted to stop on long journeys, but where they wanted to stay while undertaking rather more regional responsibilities. It's possible that Londinium had a large territorium, a territory controlled from the city around it, and that too might have been a factor here. But the point I want to emphasize is that how officialdom saw roads in the reasonably settled conditions of Flavian and later Southern Britain doesn't look like, from the evidence, it was a one-size-fits-all attitude, if at least many of the small settlements along those roads 
developed around cursus publicus establishments. And that in turn potentially tells us about how the cursus publicus operated. It was not at least just the Pony Express. It was probably often catering for requirements that were a lot more varied and varied especially from road to road. Once a lot of the military traffic, for which most roads had been laid out, dwindled, some would have lost a good deal of their purpose, at least in the eyes of the imperial authorities. So it's no surprise that lots of settlements didn't grow up along them. Neither were there lots of officially sanctioned travellers to require accommodation or new mounts, nor the level of activity that would sustain settlements economically. The key communication arteries, by contrast, Watling Street, Ermine Street, what we might think of as the motorways, not the B roads, continued to be important to the authorities. They were the roads that got the mansiones and the mutationes, and they were the ones where the amount of traffic was sufficient to see settlements offering all sorts of functions, economic, religious, whatever. Maybe then we can answer that earlier question about can we quantify the use of roads, at least in a comparative way, by looking at how many and how closely spaced the settlements along them were. Of course, as I want to keep emphasising, I'm thinking here at the level of hypothesising based on evidence we know is likely to be incomplete and I'm making assumptions. The biggest being that road line settlements at least often contained a mancio or mutatio. Even beyond the likelihood that some didn't and developed for other reasons or did, but only coincidentally, maybe like old Ford, as I say, it is hard to find or at least archeologically recognize these mancios and mutatios. But I just wonder if an element in that is not knowing what we're looking for. Was a mancio, for instance, always this brick and stone built Romanized building with hypercoths and baths? In a large settlement like Lond Londinium, I think we can assume it was. Indeed, we've got a fairly convincing example of one excavated in Southwark, um, which, more of which actually is coming up as we speak. Um, but how we differentiate a mancio from a big private inn or even a public baths, even in Londinium, I think is a question worth asking. And at a little roadside settlement, was a mancio more a comfortable but functional timber built in? And is it the building we should be looking for or what went with it? If I was right and the cursus publicus was as much concerned with relatively slow travellers and perhaps travellers with things like supply convoys as fast post riders, maybe what we ought to be looking for are the largest wagon parks that would be needed and the areas of grazing for numbers of horses and draft animals and mules. Open spaces in road line settlements, and they do seem to be present at sites like Bush Hill Park or West Hawk Farm in Kent, are often assumed to be marketplaces. But what if they were essentially the car parks around motorway services? What if the evidence we need to be looking for are things like concentrations of military harness mounts, hippo sandals, draft animals bones, and things that get casually lost or have to be discarded when travellers park up for the night in the same spot time after time. The Roman equivalent of broken taillights, hubcaps and pet cans. Well, as I said at the start, my intention has not been to try and prove anything, but to raise questions and try to examine assumptions. But I will leave you with the thought that just maybe we can differentiate what became more the motorways of Southern Roman Britain from the B roads by looking at the pattern of service stations along them. But perhaps only if we know what a Roman motorway services looked like. Thanks very much.
Thank you very much, Martin. Um, a fascinating talk. Um, I've got a couple of questions myself, um, but I'll just check to see what we have. Uh, questions are coming in now. Uh, if Please use the, the chat, everybody. If you want to put a question to Martin, um, put it in the chat. And one of, one of our uh, very valued staff this evening, Elizabeth, will put that through to me and I'll put it on to Martin. OK, well, the first one, uh, which you've pretty much um, answered, I think, certainly around Londinium. Uh, is there a good map of the location of Mansiones? No, <laughs> because we don't know where they were. That, that, that's the entire point. I mean, the strongest candidate for an actual building in one of these settlements is at Little London, where there's a small bathhouse. But then there's nothing attached to it. Um, the excretion isn't that well recorded. And there's quite a nice large villa not so far away. Um, so the answer is no, we don't have a map. And I think that's the problem. Yes. And um, I, I, I know there are one or two parts of the empire where the Cursus Publicus is better understood than it is here, but I think mm. it's a, it's pretty much a problem across the empire, isn't it? We, we don't know where most of these sites were. No, that's uh, right. Uh, and, and of course, the other problem is, did it function at all similarly in yes. those bits of the empire where we do have it slightly better recorded? Um, one suspects that a lot of it, one suspects it's a system that is adapted to local requirements by the people running the local area. Yeah, yes. That actually feeds into a question, so I'm not going to comment on that, but uh, we'll move on to the next one. Um, could the next stop after Bush Hill Park, this is from Martin Packer. Um, sorry, I should have said the first one was from John Adams, I forgot to, to mention him. Uh, yeah, from Martin Packer, could the next stop after Bush Hill Park have been not Londinium, but perhaps Welling. He says e.g. Welling, so he's suggesting somewhere in that area. Martin, your sound has dipped out, I'm afraid. Uh, yeah, I know. I, I, I think my mic, mic muted itself. Can ah, you hear me now? Yeah, I've got you now. Yeah, um, I don't think Welling can be on a, a a stop on Erming Street. Um, I, I don't. I don't quite see how that works. I'm afraid my my London geography isn't good enough to be able to answer that. <laughs> so, can't help you. Um, sorry, Martin. We haven't really answered your question. That's the the other Martin Martin Becker. Move on to the next one um, from Sean Morris. Uh, who ran the Mancios Mutatios if they were required for official business? Um, could it be that one was run better than the next? Um, next theoretical one. So people preferred one over the other uh, in the same way as everybody has the favourite pub. Yeah, I, I think that is very, very likely. I, I strongly suspect that um, there were officers in the Roman army who got together in inns in the evening and said, oh, you're going south. Don't stop at Bush Hill Park. It's a rotten services, you know, in mm. the same way that people today say, oh, I'm not going to stop at that services on the M1. The next one's better. Uh, yeah, I'm sure that happened. Yeah, um, I and, I, you know, they will have been run by appointees of the local Civitas Council. I'm almost certainly they will have sort of tended to run them. Um, and, and how well run and how attractive they were will likely have been down to how good the person who got the franchise to run them was at running Mancio's and, and probably how much profit he creamed off the top. Um, yeah, I think you're probably right. The next question actually feeds into this. Um, would the Mancio's have been more likely to be staffed and run by locals or by imported Roman expats. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm almost certain they were run by locals. Yes. I'd be astonished if, I, I mean, maybe some of the very bigger ones that you might imagine being in Londinium, you mm. might see, the, you know, the, the, the provincial governor saying, well, we, we, we need somebody with a bit more about him to, to run that one. 
uh, but the vast majority, I think, were run probably by people who had experience in running civil inns. Yeah, that, that makes perfect sense to me. Um, moving on. Yeah, we, they're rolling in now. We could be here a while. <laughs> this is what usually happens. It starts slow and then it accelerates. Right. Uh, from Martin Packer again. Could there be an advantage in being the first stop just outside London compared to being in London itself? Uh, an advantage for what? I, I mean... So the, I, I assume he's meaning to the, the, the management of a particular Mancio. Um, I, think I, I think I know what he's getting at. Forgive me, Martin, if, I, if I've got this wrong. Um, but um, I think what he's getting at, and if you were, for example, on business in a city, um, you might choose to stay just outside the city rather than the city uh, itself. Uh, right, I know um, I certainly I, tend to come into that, uh, yeah, that category. I, I'm with you. Uh, yes, as I was saying, um, I, I think it's quite interesting, this idea that Londinium may have had a large territorium around it. Now, mm -hmm. if so, that's going to be run by officials, if not actually on the imperial sort of governor's staff, then at least, you know, one's connected to it. Mm. Um, and they're going to be going out of Londinium, you know, 10, 15, 20 miles to supervise what might be estates that are producing uh, crops that are being sold in Londinium or being used to feed it. And thereby, yes, I, I can quite see officials coming out from Londinium and staying at Mancio's and Mancio's being at certain points for the convenience of those officials. Mm -hmm. Right. I I uh, so, sorry, this is the other Martin here. I just want to clarify that, that, that you interpreted my question rightly. I just think there might, we don't know necessarily the taxation regime on travellers in London versus outside, just to give one example. So maybe a traveller might prefer to stay just outside as, as, as you interpreted my, my question. I just want to confirm that's what I was thinking and I've no evidence for it, but it's, it's a way of thinking about why would you want to be close to London, but not in London? No, I, I, th I think you're right. I mean, I, I, I think there might well be reasons uh, to stay outside London. Um, I was largely thinking about people traveling along roads rather than going a short distance outside the city and then coming straight back, which I think is more sort of the area you're thinking about. But I don't see any reason why that wouldn't be the case. Um, I think you're right. We don't know enough about things like, you know, tax rates in London uh, in order to make that judgment. But yes, I think it's a possibility. Right. Um, moving on from Tony Fox. In identifying Mancionis, is there any scope to use numismatic finds? Mm. Uh, possibly, I suppose, but I don't really see that the loss of coinage would be any different there uh, to, for instance, a, a civilian stables. Yes. Um, yeah. Nor indeed really to any sort of civilian area. I, I don't think it would have a particular profile. Yeah. A, a, a Mancio might. I think that, that, that might be slightly more promising uh, because a Mancio, you, you've probably got officials and soldiers staying. They've probably got rather more money in their purse and they perhaps don't look for it when they lose the odd copper coin quite as much. But I think that's as far as we go. Mm -hmm. It's a tricky one. Um, I think I, 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 I'm a bit dubious about it, given how yeah. how um, casual losses are, are, are so commonplace in any any Roman mm. settlement, uh, yeah. and the, the the later coinage, particularly being so small, will be very yeah. easily lost. Yeah, yeah. Um, moving on, I've still got a few to go. Is there any suggestion that the modern name I've heard this before, Mount Pleasant, might indicate a possible Mancio site? Uh, I'm not aware of any reason to suggest that, but uh, no, I, I don't uh, know Mount Pleasant very uh, well. I've, I've Mount Pleasant as a name and Cold Harbour, another one, 
have in the past been associated um, with Roman roads or theoretically associated, but I'm not aware of any research that actually proves it. I am aware of some research that debunks it, um, but uh, we're not here to talk about that. <laughs> Um, from Delwyn Matthews, didn't the use of Mansiones require special permits and do we have any records of such permits being used here in Roman Britain and who by? Uh, yes and then no. Uh, yes, you had to be uh, officially accredited. How actually you'd prove it, that's another matter, but you needed to be accredited to use a Mansio or a Mansio certainly, almost certainly a Mutatio. Do we have any evidence from Britain? No. No, um, and this is one of the big problems we have for understanding anything about the infrastructure in this country, that the, the survival of records is just so poor. We have yep. very, very little. Yep. Um, and what we do have tends to be from places, well, there's the Walbrook, fortunately, but um, mainly Vindolanda, which mm. certainly doesn't tell us much about L Londinium, unfortunately, but it does tell us a lot, but it's localised. Mm. Um, we know an awful lot about life on the wall, thanks to the letters that are found there, but we have very little information about uh, what was basically everyday life and administration. Um, next one. I'm not sure what he means by this, but I'll put it to you from Christopher, no surname. Could the equivalent of modern villages have been used as mansiones or, po or posting stations? Not really sure what he means by that. Um, um, well, as, as I say, I, I think the settlements that grew up putatively round mansiones or mutationes yes. would be villages rather than towns. But, uh, the, the entire subject of what's a village, what's a town, what's a hamlet, what should we call uh, things that are smaller than cities is a nightmare. And, and yeah. those of us who work on incipient urbanism have been chasing our tails on that one, <laughs> certainly the entire time I've been in archaeology. Yes, I'm going to escape that, getting involved in that discussion. Move quickly on. <laughs> we will be here all night. Uh, from Ian and Stella Fag, Welling is southeast of Londinium. Um, pass through the expensive lawless city to a better site, bypass needed. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, I'd love to find a Roman M25, but um, I, I don't think there is one. But uh, yeah, perhaps it would have been nicer. I don't know. Yeah, th there is a theoretical northern bypass, isn't there? I'm not totally convinced about it. But uh, yeah, yes, yeah, well, sort of, yes, bypass between two roads, shall we say? Yes, yeah. Uh, and still coming um, from John Wood. If you are travelling to London, your starting point may not be a regular distance away from London, so it might end your day's journey before you get to London. This sort of feeds into what you're talking about, I think. The, therefore, there might be a number of Mansiones at short distances from London. Yeah, that, that, that's what I'm saying, really. But um, where you see Mansiones or Mutationes, if small settlements indicate their presence, they're... Uh, the multiplying of them may be due to the fact that different people need them at different uh, distances apart because they're traveling in different ways. And that may end up putting more dots along a road than if you imagine just one speed of travel, something like the fast post rider or the very slow mm. convoy. Mm. So we're looking at a range of people being served. And then there must have been compromises reached whereby we'll, we'll put one there because it's just about possible to get there if you're traveling at this slow speed in one day. Uh, but it's also gonna be convenient for those people who are traveling twice that speed. And there must have been compromises like that made. Um, <laughs> I've got to mention this. Um, this is from one of our members, Susan Rands. Hi, Susan. Um, she comments, Mount Pleasant in the Falkland Islands was probably not a Mancio. <laughs> <laughs> 
It's a very little known expedition <laughs> under Nero. Now, for some reason, my email is appears not to be working. Um, Elizabeth, if, can you send me a quick email through if if you sent one? Because um, I can see questions coming up, but I'm not getting a, them in listed form. Um, so I'll do the best I can. I may have an email problem. It's not the first time today. Just after we thought we'd fixed it. Uh, right, another one about indicators of Mansiones, suggesting the name Drop Short. This is from Christopher Spence, uh, um, who has found this name very close to Roman sites. Um, again, I'm not aware. Not, not, not something I've come across. No. And Tony Fox, again, during the pre, during and post Flavian era, is there any evidence that the volume of traffic would have changed? Evidence, no. Um, I quite think that there were periods when travel was a lot heavier than others for a variety of reasons. Mm. Uh, and, and one could speculate, you know, was there an awful lot of travel in the post? Boudican rebellion period with lots of materials going hither and thither to reconstruct towns, for instance. But there's no evidence, no. No, no there isn't. Uh, yeah, uh, okay, my email is now working, and I think it appears either I've missed one or Elizabeth has sent me one that I, I, I can't see. Anyway, yeah, I got the test, Elizabeth, but uh, we'll, we'll plow on. Um, what evidence could this is from Robert Hagerman? I hope I pronounced pronounced that correctly. Uh, what evidence could distinguish an official Mancio from a private inn? Good question. That's what I one of the things I was asking. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. That's the trouble, isn't it? Um, you know, what are we actually looking for? Since we don't have a description of a Mancio, so in Britain, um, since we don't have an illustration that we can pin down and say he's definitely a Mancio, there's that one from Rome. Mm. I mean, a Mancio in Rome is going to look a lot different to one in Britain. Um, that's that's the trouble. It's been assumed, you see, that we're looking for a ceramically ceramic building material built structure that has got lots of independent bedrooms uh, and has got underfloor heating and has got a bathhouse and so when you see evidence for something like that in a small settlement that's otherwise obviously timber built you say oh it's a mancio or a mutatio oh mancio at least mm. but i'm not I'm, I'm not i'm not convinced because the the trouble is that apart possibly from little london and as i say that's only a bathhouse we don't actually have an excavated example of what we can point to and say, well, that looks like a Mancio in a small settlement around London, or not immediately around London anyway. I mean, there are buildings I, I definitely accept as Mancionis. There's one at Melandra Castle uh, in the Northwest. Mm -hmm. um, that's got lots of little individual, clearly bedrooms, but it's slap bang outside a military fort. Um, so, I mean, that, that surely is a Mancio, um, but a Mancio in a civilian township isn't going to look like that, I shouldn't think, because mm. it's not going to be built by the military to start with. Um, and I think this is the problem. How do you differentiate a Mancio from a civil inn? And indeed, was there that much difference? The, the particular issue you've just mentioned there, that particular example, uh, at Malandra actually illustrates another problem that we sometimes have with these structures, that they don't quite seem to fit the road network as we know it. Mm -hmm. um, it's recently been um, identified that the road from Manchester um, going to Malandra doesn't actually go to Malandra at all. It bypasses it to the north, <coughs> heading over the hills towards Peniston, general direction I, I, of, I, uh, and probably to Doncaster. Um, that's a recent yeah. discovery. Uh, it, it will no doubt be in our uh, journal. I'm not, uh, I'm not at all surprised. Not that I'm plugging itinerary at all. <laughs> I'm, I'm not at all surprised. It happens to be my old stamping ground. Um, I excavated Bruff on No, uh, which is sort of a one or two forts over in uh, yeah. Hope Valley. 
Yes. Uh, and did all my PhD round there. So oh, I know I know those forts and indeed some of the roads quite well. We've got questions coming in still, so we'll, we'll okay. move on. Go on. Um, else, otherwise, we'll just keep talking about Derbyshire. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. Um, this is actually from Elizabeth, who's doing a sterling job with the emails, and they're all coming now through, Elizabeth. Thank you. Could it be that the villages preceded the road network? Um, the existing infrastructure led to sighting of the Mancio or Mutatio, um, presumably, possibly the road as well. That yeah. possibly feeds into the idea that a lot of Roman roads are actually based on um, late Iron Age precursors, although we yeah. have very little evidence for it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes, I think that's possible. I suspect it did happen in some places. There is no evidence I'm aware of from any of the settlements around London. Certainly uh, Bushill Park, uh, that's almost certainly not a pre-Roman settlement. There's no evidence that Chesham Park Farm, which are the two I'm most familiar with, are. But yes, I, I, I can see that if there's already a village, and particularly a village on a road that the Romans then formalise as a Roman road, they would do exactly the same with their Mancio and stick it where there's already a settlement. I mean, mm. It makes sense. Yes. They're practical people. Yeah. Uh, from Susan Rams. Uh, not about the Falklands this time. Um, might tile or brick stamps, if found, provide clues to whether a building is official or not? Yes, I think they would very much. I'd love to see um, an official tile stamp turn up in a small settlement around London. I would be fairly convinced then we got a Mancio. Mm. Dunn has. Mm. Um, are Mansiones only close, close to, well, this is from Mark Willingdale. Sorry, Mark, I forgot to give you a name. Are Mansiones only close to watercourses that are close to the roads? Um, since we haven't found any, we can't tell. Um, one assumes that, you know, a source of drinking water was always a locational factor. But until we find a definite Mansio, we won't know. Our well, settlements do have a tendency to be next to uh, major watercourses. And, they do, uh, and, and, and forts, forts that often preceded them almost certain, almost always were. Yeah, so, yeah. It, it's yeah. certainly possible. Yeah. Uh, from Joe Lewis, um, one of last year's speakers, considering the presence of Mancios, etc., on Ermine Street from London, do you have any thoughts on why these routes were not included in the Antonine itinerary? Good question. Uh, no, is the short answer. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really not my subject. Uh, so I wouldn't want to speculate on that. Um, the, the best I can say, Joe, on this, uh, knowing a little about the, the itineraries, the, the usual interpretation, although it's by no means the only one, is that their function was for tax collection. And in which case you wouldn't necessarily need to use every road. You would only need to use the key points that were used for tax collection. You might have thought that Ermine Street would have been, but if you need to get to places off Ermine Street, um, you would divert from it, which certainly seems to be the, the case in one or two. Um, I'm desperately trying to remember the routes, but I can't without the map in front of me. Um, it's, it's a very good question, though, and one that we don't know. We don't know, for example, whether all the itineraries that we've got in the, the compendium, if you like, um, are all of those that existed. If they were for tax collection, we honestly don't know. Uh, from Bev, this will be Bev not, I presume. Um, in a law code, there is a full description of services provided. Um, yeah, um, knowing you well, Bev, um, I guess you could tell me which one that was. If you can put it in a note on the chat, then anyone who's interested could see it, uh, which would be very useful. Um, oh, no, you can't, can you? Because you, you, you struggle with that. Sorry, um, if you could very quickly type me a note or wait to the end and I'll uh, let you say your piece on that when we've absolutely finished. Right, from Christopher. Um, no surname here. Could forums have had a dual purpose, serving also as mansiones? It's actually Chris Spence. I see at the end. Um, I think it's unlikely. Um, I'm, I'm certainly not 
forums. I mean, no, I, I don't. I don't think so. Uh, I, I don't see, you know, where within them there would have been the provision. No, um, no, I can't either. Quite honestly, it doesn't. Um, it doesn't seem likely. Right, I think from the ones from our audience, um, that's just about it. I do actually have one myself. Okay. Um, regarding your ideas of the irregular spacing um, or unpredictable spacing of, of Mansiones being due to the different journey types and from roads feeding in at different positions, as we discussed from one of the questions that came in. Is there any evidence supporting that idea from elsewhere in the empire? Uh, I haven't looked. That's an honest I haven't answer. Looked. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I, I was looking very much at Britain um, and I've only quite sort of um, superficially looked at anything from elsewhere in the empire. Mm. It's something I may well try and do, but uh, for the moment, I, I was mainly sort of concerned with thinking about how far I might be making assumptions rather than looking at evidence. Yes. And so that, that was really, you know, the starting point for this, this sort of piece of work. Yeah. So no, I, I don't know. Uh, I think it'd be very interesting to see. Um, certainly the, the Cursus Publicus, given, you know, all, all, all the sort of provisos of is that really a Mansion, et cetera, et cetera, is better known in other parts of the empire. Uh, and I think we probably could learn more from knowing more from other parts of the empire, but I haven't done that work at the moment. Okay. Um... Right. Chris Spencer's asked if it was possible, if it would be possible to put the Enfield site up again. I assume he's meaning the slide. Um, is, is that possible or a bit tricky? Uh, if I can still share my screen, how's that? Uh, That's... So if people want to know about uh, Enfield or Chestnut Park Farm, if they go to www nf arcsoc e n f a r c h s o c dot org you would be able to get uh, you would be able to get information about the roman settlement there and the chestnut park farm one um though we're not just currently at the moment selling anything because of the covid situation but uh, you can download a free copy of uh, a piece i've written on chestnut park farm Okay. And Elizabeth has actually put the um, web address onto the chat um, so everybody can see that. Okay. Um, unless there's anyone else, I'll just give it about 30 seconds in case anybody else has got a question. And if not, then Bev, if you're with us, um, Oh, hang on a minute. No, I thought something was happening. It isn't. Um, thought that was a question coming up. Bev, if you're with us, can you uh, tell us a bit more about the law code you were referring to? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was just uh, something that sparked into my mind. I think it will probably be the Theodosian or Justinian codes, but I can't remember. I, I have a feeling that it... I saw it in uh, Raymond Chevalier's Roman Roads, which has all sorts of splendid stuff. It's not uh, obviously replying to Roman Britain, or at least it may have done, but uh, not specifically. So off the top of my head, no, I can't remember where it comes from. But it certainly, certainly did. It said, that, that's a shame. You're usually a fount of all wisdom on these things. Well, there is a fount, but not an origin. <laughs> <laughs> So, sorry. It's all right, Bev. It's all nice to talk to you again anyway. Um, right. I think that is just about it. Um, we seem to be out of questions at last. Um, we're getting a lot of uh, 
positive comments in the chat. Very interesting, enjoyable, interesting talk. Thank you. Very thought provoking from Nigel Rothwell. I completely agree. Um, lots of them in the chat. It's gone down very well. So thank you very, very much again, Martin. Uh, it uh, just remain, remains for me to remind everybody that our next talk um, will be about High Street in Cumbria uh, by John Poulter. Um, I think some of us have been waiting for this one for quite some time. Uh, John's promised to, to do a piece on it for a while. Um, anyway, that is if off the top of my head. I think it's the 24th of February. I don't have the date in front of me, but we'll get that up on the website very soon. We've had a few problems with this year's uh, getting this year's uh, schedule online, but it will be up at least in crude form in the next few days. Right, it only remains for me to thank all our behind the scenes uh, staff this evening, and we've had quite a few. Um, thanks to Jim, who hosted the talk tonight. Um, that's hosted in a Zoom sense. Um, I'm just the MC. He did, did all the technical stuff that made it work. And we also have Rob, Dave, Elizabeth, of course, who handled the questions. And I don't think I've forgotten anyone this evening. I think that's it. So only remains to say thank you very much again, Martin, and good night to everybody. Thank you.